fourth onboarding already. Uh, today we're having a very special guest. Uh, we have Katerina Franceva, who is an astrophysicist. And she's working with, she's from Ukraine, but she's working uh, with Leiden University and International Astronomical Union. Uh, the fun fact that I know about Kate is that uh, there is an uh, asteroid named, uh, <laughs> named after her. <laughs> But I'm sure Katya will present herself the best to you. So, uh, Katya, the floor is yours. And yeah, let's enjoy the talk. Yeah. Thank you very much, Martina, for the presentation. Uh, yeah. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Katarina Franceva. And um, uh, I also would like to thank to all the organizers for inviting me uh, to give the talk and also to help with the program. I, I think that it's... Uh, a really cool program, very important, and I'm looking forward to all the projects that will be the, the end result of it. Um, tonight, I want to talk um, to you uh, about how we can merge astronomy and tourism in Ukraine and um, how we can do that based on the case studies worldwide. And if I can click, or maybe I can't click. And uh, yes, I can click. Um, so first, I just wanted to very briefly introduce myself, so you also know who I am and uh, who is talking to you today. Um, yeah, so I come from Ukraine. Uh, I was born uh, in the city of Fontaines in Ukraine, in Vinnytsia. I did my uh, bachelor master studies in uh, Kyiv, in the Teras um, Shevchenko National University of Kyiv. Uh, then I moved to the Netherlands, to the city of Groningen to do a PhD in uh, astrophysics uh, in the field of planetary astronomy and uh, astrobiology. Uh, I also worked as a researcher and lecturer here at the University of Groningen. And uh, since last year, I work for the University of Leiden and International Astronomical Union as a project developer. Um, let me, yes. Uh, I also wanted to give you just a brief uh, explanation of what I did uh, as a researcher in astronomy. So I used to study asteroids and uh, yeah, the fun thing about asteroids that usually when, when someone says asteroids, you, you're gonna think, oh my God, these are those rocks uh, flying in space that uh, every month they come to the newspapers uh, uh, and uh, in the notifications of that the asteroid is coming close, we're all gonna die. Um, but except for being a threat and uh, uh, popping up all the time in the news, being super scary, asteroids are also actually very cool and very interesting to study. So um, that was the main research area that uh, I worked in. So I was studying asteroids and also comets. Um, asteroids are super fun. They are rocky bodies of different sizes that uh, fly, uh, that orbit around the sun in our solar system. And they're very interesting because they, um, uh, they contain information about the very early stages of the formation of our solar system. So at the time when the planets were still not formed, uh, but asteroids were already formed. And so it's very interesting to study them because through asteroids we can look into a very, very distant past of the solar system. Um, so in general, astronomy... Uh, is seen as a luxury science and that uh, that only the first world countries can afford. And it is also often believed that this is a science that requires very expensive infrastructures and um, yeah, that um, it's it cannot be used for um, economically disadvantaged countries. Uh, so for example, especially the many African countries that face socioeconomic challenges. Uh, and for this reason, astronomy very often uh, appears as a yeah, low priority science. But actually, the, uh, it, that's not the case and that, that shouldn't be the case because uh, one thing that astronomy uh, has uh, that is common for all of us, that's the night sky. That's the night sky that has been there always for, for all previous generations, for all people across the globe. And so, for example, I wanted to, yeah, to give us an example why I got interested in astronomy uh, as a kid, because uh, when when I was still small and uh, we would go back home with my parents from, I don't know, visiting their friends um, in order to entertain me, my mom would uh, show me the stars, show me the constellations, show me the, would tell me the stories behind the constellations. 
Um, and another episode I remember, it's uh, when I was uh, about five years old, um, there was a co very bright comet passing by, Comet Hale-Bopp. And yeah, my parents also brought me outside uh, to to watch the night sky, and it was it was incredibly interesting and it was very inspiring. And yeah, for this we just uh, well we needed a pair of binoculars, but actually the comet was also very bright that you could see it just with your naked eyes, so you didn't need binoculars. And that's something that, um, for example, all people in Europe could see. And uh, you don't need any expensive. Uh, yeah, um, any expensive uh, uh, observational uh, tools in order to to do that. Okay. Um, also, I want to say that astronomy, as a fundamental science, um, it contributes to to many uh, many things in the world. Uh, it contributes to culture and society uh, through inspiration, um, also through uh, study of anthropology, history. It contributes to technology and skills. So, for example, to optics uh, by developing the state of art telescopes or on, all around the globe, to computing, uh, to electronics, to, to space research. Uh, and of course, it contributes to science and research. So it, uh, astronomy contains uh, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics. So astronomy is a very diverse, uh, is a very diverse field. And um, yeah, I would just highlight again that it's also incredibly inspirational. Um, I would like to also say a few words about the International Astronomical Union. So that's one of the organizations that I work for now. Uh, so International Astronomical Union, that's, that's a union of uh, uh, astronomers all around the globe. And the participants currently are about 12,000 astronomers in about 93 countries worldwide. And um, uh, through the uh, yearly contributions of all the countries that are part of the International Astronomical Union, uh, the union can support the work of uh, four offices that they have. So it's an office for young astronomers, Office of Astronomy for Development, Office for Astronomy Outreach, and Office of Astronomy for Education. So these are different offices that contribute to uh, different directions of, uh, uh, of how we can use astronomy and for what we can use astronomy in the world, and they coordinate programs worldwide. And the office that I would like to highlight that I think it's um, uh, will be important to refer to in my talk today, that's Office of Astronomy for Development. So, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, so in this talk today, I try to put um, as many links and resources as possible, uh, especially for the uh, for the group uh, who that will be working on the on the topic revolving the night, uh, because uh, I thought, OK, um, I will talk about astrotourism and that's that's a relatively new field. So, um, of course, there are many things to say, but uh, probably uh, uh, there will be not so many materials, but I found that uh, even though being the field so young, there are already lots of materials that you can go through as an inspiration for your future project on the astrotourism uh, in Ukraine. So I tried to put all these links here so that later on you can go through the presentation and then you can open all the different booklets and videos and workshops, etc. So, for example, first thing that I would like to highlight, there has been organized uh, astrotourism workshop by the International Astronomical Union. Um, and um, it's, it's very, very interesting and very inspiring because there you can learn... Uh, in general about the, the field of astrotourism, but also about the experience of experiences of people worldwide uh, and how they implemented different astrotourism uh, programs in their countries. So I wanted to highlight work uh, of Office of Astronomy for Development. So what is actually the Office of Astronomy for Development? That's an office uh, that aims to further the use of astronomy, including its practitioners, skills and infrastructures as a tool for sustainable development globally. So basically that's how astronomy, uh, well, we're focused on astronomy contributions to the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, the structure of the office is that the, the main office is located in uh, South Africa, uh, but they also developed uh, a network of regional offices across the globe and 
European regional office is hosted in Leiden. And so together with my colleagues, with Pedro Russo and George Mali, uh, I co coordinate the, the work of this uh, office. Um, one of the things that was done by our office in the past uh, is the translation of the design manual for astrotourism experiences. Uh, so this is uh, this manual was design developed in Chile and then was translated to English by uh, by our office. And so in general, uh, what uh, what this uh, manual is for. Uh, this manual offers guidance and knowledge on improving the, the quality, appeal, and diversity of the astrotourism experiences that may be designed and implemented in different local settings. And uh, the, the, let's say the, the target audience uh, of this manual is of course uh, owners, managers, and decision makers of institutions that offer astronomical tourism experiences today. Uh, uh, but also this manual can be uh, very useful for entrepreneurs who want to venture into this promising sector. So for example, Team is gonna be working on the topic Realding the Night. I think that uh, this manual also will give you uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, ideas and in general uh, tools on how to create a, a, um astro tourism experience. Uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about uh, astronomy in Ukraine. Um, so uh, here we can see the, the, the map of Ukraine with the indication of the observatories or uh, astronomy related institutions that we have. And actually, so uh, Ukraine being the largest country in Europe, it's huge. And we also have a lot of different institutions related to astronomy. So we have um, and here I have a list for you. So we have different observatories. We have departments at the university. So uh, that's Kiev, Odessa, Kharkiv, Poltava, Mykolaiv, Uzhgorod, Chernihiv, Androshiv, Kalviv. And so this list here, that's the list of, of astronomical observatories, but also list of departments of astronomy and space physics at the universities and different in, uh, institutes that are part of the National uh, Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And um, uh, so these are the institutions, uh, astronomical institutions in Ukraine that are um, um, mostly focused on education and research. Of course, they also do outreach activities. But apart from that, we also have planetariums in Ukraine, right? So for example, in Vinyatsa, we have a planetarium uh, where I used to go as a kid. Uh, there is also a great planetarium in Kyiv. Um, so the, the amount of astronomical uh, infrastructure and also the people that work on astronomy in Ukraine, I would say that it's uh, it's quite large. Um, and another thing that I would like to highlight uh, that is important for the astrotourism uh, reasons. So here you can see the light pollution map of Europe. And so the, um, the map legend basically says that uh, the the brighter the, the spot, the, the stronger the um, light pollution is. And if you have the, the basically the, the, the black dark regions, then these are the darkest ones. So if you look here, you see that, uh, well, uh, in Europe, so for example, Spain, France, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Italy um, is extremely light polluted. But if you then move, to the east, you move to Ukraine, you see that actually Ukraine uh, is one of the darkest spots uh, in, in Europe in terms of light pollution. So actually, uh, this is a really great spot if you want to, to go in the night outside and just watch the night sky, look at the constellations, etc. So of course, you see a very bright spot uh, around Kyiv. But for example, if you look at the north of Ukraine, it's uh, yeah, it's just pitch dark. So um, in terms of uh, yeah, preservation of night sky and uh, also using the the dark sky and the low light pollution for for the uh, for attracting tourists for the different astro tourism experiences, Ukraine is really really a great spot for that. And of course, we uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, depends if you go in the rural areas or if you go closer to the cities, then of course in the cities the light pollution is stronger, but even if you look the the outskirts of various uh, large cities in Ukraine, 
uh, there is still, um, yeah, you can find lots and lots of uh, um, places and areas that are extremely dark. While, for example, if you look here, the area of Belgium and the Netherlands, it is very extremely polluted. So um, finding a, a pitch dark spot where you can see lots and lots of stars is um, becoming uh, extremely complicated. Um, now I would like to talk to you about what is actual astrotourism because I keep saying now more and more astrotourism, astrotourism, but what that is. Um, astrotourism focuses on the forgotten side of uh, nature tourism, which is the night sky. And uh, since nowadays we have uh, more and more uh, interest and urgency of sustainability practices in tourism, astronomy can play a really big role in the transformation. Um, by promoting the importance of clear dark skies, but not only to uh, astronomical research, but also as a heritage for humankind and our gateway to the universe. Because um, as I said earlier, that the dark skies, the, uh, the view of the stars, constellations, Milky Way, that's something that has been there always, uh, yeah, since the beginning of the humankind and until now. So that's something that, um, uh, has to be definitely preserved because, for example, with the current uh, with the current speed of how the sky becomes more and more polluted, uh, the next generation uh, of uh, humankind will not be able to see, uh, for example, the the Milky Way, or will not be able to see the night sky as yeah as as we had it or as uh, our uh, parents or grandparents had it, and um, that's gonna be a, a huge uh, effect on the on the humankind all across the planet. Um, where is the niche of astrotourism? And so there are different um, uh, various types of tourism nowadays that are, um, for example, this can be cultural tourism, can be activity based, uh, rural, natural. But I think that the astrotourism uh, can be placed into the niche of principled ecotourism. Uh, which includes more environmentally friendly practices, protect the natural and cultural heritage of a destination, but also support local communities. And um, so principled ecotourism, it's also not about the, the checklist of these things that I just said, but it's also about the, the, the ethics, about working with the community and also involving the community uh, where in, in the area where you decide to uh, create your astro tourism activity. Um, so another question also, what are astrotourism experiences? And uh, well, astrotourism comprises uh, recreational and or educational activities, which are developed around the cosmos, uh, around astronomical phenomena and the ways of understanding them. Um, and the ways of understanding them both in the past so how it was, yeah, used, uh, how it was done in uh, by our uh, previous generations and uh, about uh, different stages of the humankind development. And also the ways of understanding this phenomena in the present. So including the latest scientific findings um, as well as the instruments and technologies that astronomers use in uh, astronomy nowadays. So different telescopes and observational stations, etc. Um, now, also a very good question, why should we care about tourism? Why should we develop it? Why should we um, in invest into it in any way? Uh, one paper that I would like to, to cite here, it's the, the recent paper from, um, well, actually uh, just last month, so 19 January 2023 in Science Journal. And uh, this paper um, uh, focused on uh, uh, studying light pollution and was done through the uh, citizen science uh project and so basically they analyzed uh, uh different uh, how the, the the sky bright brightness was changing from 2011 to 2022 and what they found is that uh the, the trends in their data showed that the average night sky uh, got brighter by about 10 percent um per year from 2011 to 2022 so 10 percent per year brighter and this is equivalent to doubling the sky brightness uh, every eight years. So basically every eight years, your sky becomes double and double brighter. Um, 
And um, so I think, yeah, again, this this is one of the uh, urgencies why we have to uh, invest into astrotourism and why we have to uh, implement uh, as many astrotouristic experiences around the world uh, as possible, because one of the um, big focuses of astrotourism is preservation of dark sky and fighting light pollution. And um, yeah, basically, for example, this paper shows that if we don't speed up and if we don't put efforts into uh, reducing the light pollution and uh, caring for our dark sky, then you know, we just, we, we're gonna lose the sky, the night sky as, as we know it. And for example, um, Another interesting thing is that uh, nowadays when you go outside and you, you watch the night sky, um, uh, nowhere on the planet it is possible to see uh, the, the night sky um, uh, without any humankind, uh, human, human, uh, human made, uh, well, things in the sky. So there are lots of satellites, etc. And um, yeah, they also, that, that's another problem of uh, space pollution. But basically that there is no way you can see the pristine dark sky uh, anymore, anywhere on the planet. Um, so yeah, first highlight I would say, and first uh, urge uh, of astrotourism is let's protect the dark skies and let's fight the light pollution to be able to see the stars, to be able to see the Milky Way. And uh, well, I don't know, tell, uh, tell to each other really nice and interesting stories about what is happening uh, up there. Um, astrotourism has, of course, um, um, opportunities. Well, there are opportunities for astrotourism. And uh, by opportunities, I mean uh, elements in the environment uh, that the field uh, and its organizations could use to its advantage. And so here you have a uh, surging interest in nature tourism and ecotourism. Uh, increased number of seniors with disposable travel income. Uh, you have increased number of families with less income going to cheap national parks. Uh, interest in rural economic development by government entities. Uh, Well-developed certification program for dark sky parks reserves. Um, opportunities to locate facilities in new regions. And of course, demand for professionalism and certified guides. Except for opportunities, there are, of course, general threats and uh, general threats. And here, I think it covers more of uh, tourism in general, that uh, tourism is back on its legs. But uh, yeah, af after COVID, uh, where uh, it was quite a harsh period. But of course, tourism does have sensitivity to future pandemics uh, and different travel restrictions, etc. Um, you also uh, need um, community and government support, uh, and um, it needs a significant cultivation and time. Uh, you have uh, competition between different uh, forms of ecotourism. For example, the, the ecotourism during the daylight, um, I think, um, yeah, probably will have um, easier way to, to attract people. Uh, it also requires significant capital investment, maintenance costs. People skills, technical skills, business skills um, in small organizations. Um, the the fact that this field also relies uh, too much on heroic efforts. Uh, this re refers lots to that many things uh, in in astronomy, in science, are quite often done on volunteer basis. And um, another general threat is that the considerations of indigenous indigenous people and wild places are complex issues. So. Um, yeah, you'll always have to take uh, into account the, the, the area where you want to bring your uh, astrotourism experience. And the specific threats and problems for the astrotourism in particular is the isolation, because of course, uh, if you want to do um, uh, astronomy related things, then uh, usually these uh, um, these facilities or these places has to be uh, quite isolated. Um, uh, you also have, well, lack of resources, vulnerabilities, uh, lack of high quality resources available for the basic or advanced training. So for example, there is no textbook, but as I said earlier today that uh, there are already manuals, workshops and uh, experiences uh, of different groups worldwide that uh, uh, new people can base their experience on. But of course, more uh, advanced training would be uh, desirable a lot. Um, 
And with this, I would like to move actually to the examples of astrotourism uh, around the globe. And, and yes, so um, here I again refer to the astrotourism manual. And um, so here um, uh, that's actually take, taken from the manual. Uh, and this is basically not um, a list of exact examples, so some uh, particular activities implemented somewhere, but this is more different groups of examples of uh, just for you to, to better understand uh, which types of activities can be uh, part of astrotourism. So for example, this can be sky observations in observatories, can be excursions with outdoor observations, uh, tours of scientific facilities. So for example, scientific observatories uh, or um, um, for example, if you, yeah, usually it's scientific observatories, if you have some uh, telescopes or maybe planetarium, etc. So uh, then it can be lodging and astronomical observations, uh, solar observations, astrophotography, lectures and courses, astronomical exhibition tours, and audiovisual presentations. Um, another Thing that you also have to keep in mind is that um, astrotourism programs worldwide are models for various things. They are models for sustainable social economic benefits for communities and small astronomy businesses, for integration of community education into nonprofit and for-profit ventures, uh, for collaboration with integrity with indigenous people, um, uh, models for programs that appeal to diverse or high specialized audiences, stewardship of dark sky areas and quality speciality or additive experiences. Uh, first example, I think of uh, astrotourism that has to be highlighted, uh, that's astrotourism in Chile. And um, why I say that it really has to be uh, highlighted uh, because if we look at Chile, the northern part of the country uh, uh, has more than 40% uh, of the infrastructure for astronomical observations all around the world. And it has been estimated that it will, in the next 10 years, it will increase to 60%. So basically uh, about half of all the infrastructure for astronomical observations are located in Chile. And plus on top of that, uh, why Chile is so great for astrotourism is because they have a large number of days of clear sky year, each year. It's about uh, 300 days per year on average. They also have quite few dust particles and humidity in the air and the diverse geography of the terrains. Uh, so uh, where you can place different observatories. And so that's why Chile is one of the, well, one of the, the, the most perfect places on the planet uh, to uh, install telescopes. And so here you have examples, Paranal Observatory, Alma Observatory, extremely large telescope that is actually uh, being constructed right now. Um, so the huge amount of the state of the art observatories uh, in the planet many of them located in Chile. And that's why, of course, it provides um, a great place uh, to practice astrotourism and to focus on it. And uh, here I have, uh, I combined a list of different things, actually different uh, astrotourism uh, experiences that are happening in Chile. So these are observatory visits that include facility visits and open air experiences. So you go to the observatory, you, you have a look around, you learn about how it works, etc. And then ethno astrotourism and uh, or how it's uh, also called uh, archaeoastronomy. Uh, uh, this uh, field communicates the impact that the stars had on the entire structure of the life of the Andean people. Um, um, for example, something similar uh, can be also done in Ukraine if we go to the Carpathian Mountains and uh, how the, uh, the, the the stars, which impact the stars had on the, the structure of life of, uh, for example, Hutsuls in the in the very past. Uh, another um, uh, active astro touristic activity, it's uh, combining astronomy tours with archaeological tours. So observation of classical and indigenous constellations using amateur telescopes. Then uh, can be astrophotography tours by experienced photographers. 
uh, night walks and special talks for solstices and equinoxes, uh, combining astronomical tours with the tasting of local wines and gastronomic experiences. So for example, this is also something that definitely can be done in Ukraine with different um, um, agronomical tourism, so merging uh, astronomical tour and uh, agronomical tour, going to small farms, to uh, to places where uh, people create some cheese farms, etc. Um, and in the capital, so in, in Chile, in the capital, uh, they also have different uh, astrotouristic experiences, for example, introductory lectures in astronomy, observation with binoculars, um, different types of telescopes, so um, amateur ones, and then maybe slightly bigger ones, and also demonstration of astrophotography. Um, one example that I also wanted to highlight uh, in particular, so of course, every observatory um, has their own uh, program on astrotourism, also their own program on outreach and education, and also on uh, how they contribute to development of the country, how they contribute to development of the local communities. And here I wanted to bring as an example Alma Observatory. And uh, so um, the observatory contributes to the development of Chile uh, by creating jobs for local communities. So for example, about 80% of people working for Alma Observatory are locally hired. Uh, and also observatory uh, implements a program to improve the education in science and in English uh, in local public school. Um, uh, among things that the observatory implemented, they provided training uh, for um, uh, local teachers, uh, also provided funding to build needed infrastructure, provided hands-on material, uh, and uh, also they uh, would do periodic feedback on the program implementation through education specialists. So basically you not only implement programs that, that, that you do, but you also uh, try to, yeah, to, to ask for feedback, to receive feedback and then improve your, your program constantly through the feedback. Um, observatory also committed to building a visitor center in the local community, which also can be a, a great uh, center for, for astrotourism. Um, and um, basically what the visitor center will do will allow to promote uh, outreach activities of the observatory, but will also contribute to the development of scientific knowledge of visitors and will help position uh, the, the area of the observatory as one of the main tourist attractions in Chile. Uh, on top of that, the observatory also partnered with a local museum uh, to promote the preservation of the local cultural heritage and its vision uh, of the cosmos uh, through an uh, ethnoastronomy project designed in Spanish and English. So, um, yeah, there are many different activities that, that can be done. And uh, I think that, for example, Alma Observatory is doing a great job. Um, another example, now we move to the United States, uh, it's called, the project is called Windows on the Universe Center for Astronomy Outreach. And so here you see the picture that's actually um, a solar telescope called MacMath Pierce, and it's located at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona State. Uh, and so the telescope uh, got retired because it was just too old. And so basically uh, a, a group of uh, scientists, um, they uh, wrote a proposal uh, to the National Science Foundation uh, with the idea to transform this, uh, yeah, this uh, telescope uh, into astronomy visualization and presentation center. And so I, they actually secured funding of four and a half uh, million dollars to, uh, to do this project. And yeah, now uh, this will be, a uh, this, I think that the, the, all the refurbishment and installation should be finished somewhere actually this year in 2023. And so now, uh, well, this used to be just an old telescope that was not used anymore, but now it will be transformed into an amazing center and will attract uh, yeah, lots of people um, for sure within the States uh, and probably also people from abroad uh, to, um, to learn more about astronomy and, uh, engage in different astronomy uh, uh, activities. Uh, another example, now we move to South Africa. Uh, this is called SALT, uh, SALT Telescope, which stands for the South African Large Telescope. 
It was built near the town of Sutherland uh, in the semi-desert region of Karoo in South Africa, as I said already. And um, so um, there was also a very big uh, um, project that was accompanying the, the building of the telescope uh, about how the telescope can actually contribute back to the community and also how it can uh, improve tourism in the region. So one thing that they did, they created a community a community development center. Um, uh, and also um, they, uh, yeah, basically that the, the community center and then the visitor center uh, would be used as an enhancement to improve tourism in the region. Um, uh, they did some studies on how many visitors were uh, attracted by, the, uh, by the, the, the visitor center. And so over the period of 2015 to 2018, the observatory uh, attracted more than 50,000 uh, visitors. And um, according to the data, this is uh, this makes it one of the greatest attractions for people to visit um, uh, in the Northern Cape province in the South Africa. Um, Observator also actively participates in the socioeconomic development of the local vi village, so near which uh, the observatory is located, and uh, by creating jobs for the youth in the local communities. And they estimated that uh, as of 2017, about 6% of the population of uh, town uh, Sutherland were directly employed by the observatory. And then they also did a study that showed that uh, about 20% uh, of the population indicated that they either derived some benefits from building uh, for, from the building of the telescope or actually that um, uh, a member of their family uh, got employed uh, by the observatory uh, for various tasks. Um, additionally, also uh, the observatory um, organized different workshops and school visits uh, for teacher training and also to just um, to do STEM um, education for kids. And uh, they were they reached about fifty thousand school kids and also about two thousand teachers. Um, uh, in in different uh, educational activities that they provided. Um, another example, um, maybe not so much about astrotourism, but in general, how you can, um, if you have the, the support of the government, how you can uh, attract more people to the STEM field. And this is a White House Astronomy Night. So uh, first time happened in 2009 uh, at the, well, basically on the side of the White House. And then every year uh, was uh, repeated as a yearly event uh, in, uh, in Washington. And um, these events uh, aim to motivate interest in astronomy and science education and increase motivation for children to enter science, technology, and engineering and mathematics fields. Uh, so basically, uh, this was a night where people uh, would be, uh, well, the first time when it was organized, I think it was a private event, but still it was streamed uh, and um, popularized uh, a lot on the uh, on the different uh, social media channels, but also on the TV, etc. And then every next year, this was an open event that was happening not directly next to the White House, but uh, on, in the big park. And um, what you could find at these events would be optical telescopes, uh, moon rocks, meteorites, and different presentations of solar system. Uh, you would find their uh, real life astronaut. And also they would try to bring uh, role model school kids, so basically kids that would do some science projects and um, uh, would discover something through the science projects, which is very cool if you can, yeah, bring these kids and then um, um, show the, the things that they were able to do at school through different uh, STEM projects. And then in this way, you can uh, increase motivation of other, other kids across the country uh, to do some, to do science, to, to be interested in science and technology and uh, do fun things uh, in your uh, science lessons. Um, a similar activity, well, not so fancy anymore. Uh, and that's an example that uh, you've seen uh, 
in your previous, well, last week at the onboarding by Milena, that's a Flagstaff start party. And um, Flagstaff is the world's first international dark sky city. And uh, every year it hosts the annual Flagstaff start party uh, where you yeah, basically uh, to reach the local community visitors to, to show various dark sky experiences. And why I wanted to highlight the Flagstaff uh, star party because um, Flagstaff, as I said, it's the world's first international dark sky city. But um, maybe you would ask, yeah, but uh, who decides if this is an international dark sky city? What does it mean world's first? And um, there is an organization that is called the International Dark Sky Association, uh, IDA, and it's the recognized authority uh, on um, light pollution, and uh, it is the leading organization combating light pollution worldwide. And uh, incredibly cool project that uh, the International Dark Sky Association has is the International Dark Sky Places program. So here you can see the map uh, that shows you different dark sky places uh, that are part of the program across the planet. Um, this program was founded in 2001 to uh, encourage uh, communities, parks, uh, protected areas uh, across the globe uh, to preserve and protect the dark sides through responsible lighting policies and public education. Um, so as you see, for example, there is no markings on the territory of Ukraine, but um, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, your projects are, uh, your future projects uh, will uh, definitely help to put a few markers uh, on the map. And uh, this brings me to a local example. So uh, I live in the city of Groningen, which is in the north of the Netherlands. And um, uh, here, uh, a little bit north from Groningen, near the, the Vaden Sea, we have a dark sky park that is called Lauersmeer. And uh, so, the dark sky park, uh, well, first became the dark sky park in 2016 and was done by the forest uh, service. And then later they also invited astronomers because, well, uh, if you have a dark sky uh, park and uh, you also want to do some activities related to that, you definitely need astronomers. And here in the city of Groningen, we have a very nice astronomy institute. So there were uh, uh, that created a beautiful collaboration. Uh, so. What do they have in the in the in the park? So first of all, that's of course a national park, but also now there is a visitor center um, with uh, various information on astronomy and also on the on the national park itself. And in summer, the center is visited by uh, a few hundred people per day. Um, and um, the park also, well, in in the near the visit in the park, there is also a robotic telescope that is used by the students of the astronomy institute here in Groningen. And they also do various uh, science projects on studying the light and the air pollution. Um, and also a program that they're implementing now, it's called Donkerte van de Vaden. And this is basically a program uh, that creates uh, dark uh, um, experience places uh, along the entire Vaden coast. And Vaden coast is the, the northern coast of, of the Netherlands. Um, um, and yeah, basically these are various activities that are organized to attract more tourists, to attract uh, also to, to educate um, people living in the area about the darkness and about the importance of the light sky and also about uh, what are the effects of the light pollution on flora and fauna and um, also on the on on humans and um so what i wanted to show you here so here you have the map of the north of the netherlands so here you have Kroningen, uh, very strong light pollution and here you have the Lauersmeer national park so if you look at the, the map legend that's about green let's say but if we compare it to ukraine um yeah, okay. For example, uh, Kyiv has a, has a very strong light pollution, but if we move a little bit outside or if we go to Vinita, okay, Vinita is also, yeah, in the city itself, it's highly polluted like every other city. But if you just move a little bit outside, you can find extremely, extremely dark places. If you go to the north of Ukraine, then uh, that's, that's just uh, amazing uh, how beautiful sky uh, you should be able to see there. So for example, um, yeah, uh, Lauersmeer National Park is uh, uh, got the 
was certified by the uh, International Dark Sky Association as a dark sky place. Um, so just to show you that if the, the green, uh, green mapped area on the light pollution map uh, can be certified as the dark sky place, then uh, Ukraine offers lots of uh, opportunity for various dark sky places. Uh, one idea, not really the idea, but something just that I wanted to mention, and maybe um, it will give you an idea about, uh, yeah, where to start or just about some uh, strange experiences that can be done related to astrotourism. Um, uh, in Ukraine, we have an online uh, magazine that writes about music and everything related to music, which is called Sluch. And uh, once scrolling through their website, I saw an ad that uh, one of the uh, music producers is gonna play in the um, uh, near observatory that is called White Elephant. And that's an abandoned observatory on mountain Pipivan, which is also called Chernogora. And it's the, uh, the third highest mountain in Ukraine. So basically, yeah, he played a, a set of a nice electronic music with the view on the observatory. And um, to me, this was uh, an interesting experience of how you can merge together uh, interest in, uh, in music, but also interest in, uh, in astronomy, in nature, in... Uh, um, uh, yeah, so I, I just found it as a very interesting experience. And uh, what is cool also about the mountain that it hosts uh, unique flora, fauna, and it's in the middle of the Carpathian Mountains. It's also in the middle like uh, in the middle of that area, there was the sanctuary of an ancient Slavic god. Um, so here you also can uh, add some uh, ethno uh, ethno tourism, uh, archaeo tourism. Um, and Pipivan used to be, or this uh, sec was sacred mountain for Hutsuls. Uh, that's how you can see the night sky near the, the observatory. Um, the observatory was uh, open in 1938 and yeah, now it's abandoned and I read online that there were some projects between, I think, uh, ivano Frankivsky University uh, and, and also Polish partners to uh, maybe bring back to life the observatory. But I think it's really cool that we have this uh, an amazing observatory on the third highest mountain in Ukraine. And um, the... The experience of the, the music being played at the amazing location, which was also which was also uh, related to astronomy, reminded me about the um, quite famous project that exists, and it's a project called Circle. So it's a, it's a French company. What they do, they bring um, uh, electronic uh, uh, music producers producers to play at um, at this well let's call it special and unique locations across the planet. In some cases, they just record the, the, the set and then they put it online. And in some cases, they actually advertise it and they bring people for this. So basically, this is also how you can combine, uh, well, in this case, this is a combination of music and tourism. So for example, uh, here you have, uh, the set was played at the Biosphere Museum in Canada and, um, that's a museum about um, uh, about preservation of nature. Uh, so I think that also museum uh, got lots of advertisement from uh, simply uh, having a set played there and then being put on YouTube and watched by millions and millions of people across the globe. Then you have here uh, the set played at the Griffin Observatory in uh, LA in the United States. Um, this is one of the example where they played in the uh, in the solar uh, Salardo Uni in Bolivia, which is um, uh, a huge salt lake. And here was the actually two day festival at the Air and Space Museum in Paris in France. Uh, so uh, again, everything was recorded, put online. And this is also the way how you can advertise in special places. So that's that that's not a um, um, yeah, not an idea to, to implement, but just uh, something that I've seen. And I thought that's that's really nice idea of how you can combine uh, different uh, audi target audiences um, together um, and how you can try to, yeah, how you can promote things even maybe without 
thinking uh, that that that's going to be the end result. For example, like promoting the Air and Space Museum in Paris, that now millions of people know about its existence. And this brings me to my conclusion that uh, astrotourism has tremendous promise as a field, and uh, Ukraine has one of the darkest skies in entire Europe, which has tremendous promise as a, a place for astrotourism activities. And um, if well implemented, an astrotourism program can be a powerful tool to boost the socioeconomic development of a rural area. And um, yeah, so here I think we can go to questions. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, looking forward to your questions. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Katia. That was a great amount of some inspiration and I guess new knowledge, at least for, for me and people who don't have much in common with astronomy yet. And uh, yeah, now we have time for some questions from, from you. And we'll spend some time on the Q&A session. And afterwards, we would ask the group uh, rewilding the night to stay and have a discussion with Katia about your potential directions of your projects and your initial ideas. Uh, but yeah, now let's welcome some questions. Is there anything that you would like to ask or share or discuss? And use the uh, raise hand function if you if you want to ask something. OK, Anton, yeah, go for it. OK, uh, hi. Thank you, Katerina, for uh, interesting uh, presentation. And what can I want to say? Um, as for me, uh, astro tourism is uh, strategically it's strategical development, uh, but um, how should we explain this idea to implement astro tourism in, in Ukraine for government? Uh, because um, I think after war, uh, our, uh, our budget will be limited and uh, maybe a bigger part uh, of government uh, will think that um, there is a lot of another thing uh, which uh, they need to um, maybe rebuild buildings uh, and uh, astrotourism is uh, expensive uh, thing. And how should we explain um, that it should be implemented? Hi, Anton. Thanks a lot for the question. I think, yeah, that that's also a super important thing to talk about. Uh, uh yeah let's say uh, about the funding and uh, how yeah how we can explain to the government why we have to care about it and i think one of the cool things also about the astrotourism is that it's not always about lots of funding because for example if you already have some um, astronomy facilities then you don't need to invest money into building new ones you simply need to create programs um uh, around the facilities that already exist so for example, um, and the same for the dark sky uh, park. So if you have a place that is pitch dark, uh, there is no need to, uh, you don't need to, I don't know, to build like a proper, super fancy, expensive telescope in there to bring people. So what you can do, you have a national park with a great dark sky and yeah, maybe you will have to build a visitor center, but in many national parks, there are already visitor centers. So you would have to partner with them and to add new experiences to add to, yeah, you will need to invest into um, uh, maybe training people that would do some guided tours or would do some explanation. But for this, that's why also I highlighted that we have many astronomy uh, infrastructure uh, institutions in Ukraine. So that's also the way how you can partner with people who already know about astronomy and are very happy to talk about it. So I think my main point is that, yeah, that astro tourism experiences are not that expensive if you think about them. They're very expensive if you want to build a super huge telescope at first. But yeah, that's of course something that um, um, we don't, we, yeah, there will be no uh, money in the budget for. But you can still use the, uh, the infrastructure that is already in place. And in this case, it's not very expensive. And again, also to uh, how you can explain it to the, to the government. Well, uh, you can say that, yeah, that this is gonna boost uh, and help the tourism in Ukraine. And also on top of that, that uh, because Ukraine is the unique place that has the darkest sky in Europe, 
this also can be an extremely, um, yeah, a very efficient way of uh, promoting these experiences and uh, explaining why they're unique and why they have to be implemented. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Milena, do you want to ask or add something to that? Yeah, yeah, so actually, uh, I mean, thank you for, for, for the talk, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. Uh, uh, I wanted to just like uh, comment on it and maybe ask you, Katerina, for, for also your commentary on the topic of the fact that uh, in astrotourism, as you said, we very often need people who, who know astronomy. And we don't have like many people, well, we can see it also in Poland, like, okay, we have uh, trained astronomers, but it's not so many of them. And then we have some like astronomy enthusiasts. Uh, and uh, those are people who potentially could be like educators or, 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 or guides. Uh, but it's not so easy for, uh, let's say, um, I would call it like normal tourist guide uh, to, to get this astronomy in, a, I don't know, like in one day course, right? So it's like, so basically just wanted to co comment that this step from tourism to astrotourism for let's say guides or for, for owners of, I don't know, guest houses who, who would like to make some there that are in, in attractive places and they want to do some stargazing is quite high. Uh, so there is like, a, I believe it's also a, a big thing uh, in, in terms of, of uh, education, but education in the sense of, uh, uh, of, of, of of helping those who would like to make their places there. I don't know, like some place they have like some house in the mountains, they want to make a, like an astro guest house. Uh, they would like to have it uh, uh, more uh, appealing for people, but they, they don't really know how to get into that. So could you also comment on that in a sense that it's not so easy from my point of view? Yeah, no, I totally agree that that's not very easy. And um, yeah, so the, the way to go around it, not, not around it, but the, how we can tackle it and how we can solve it in my point of view is that um, basically creating, for example, uh, and distributing this kind of manual. So for example, we have a manual on how to design uh, astro tourism experience. Now it's in Spanish and English. So for example, even simply translating this guide into Ukrainian, that's already gonna help lots of people who, who want to try to go into this uh, adventure. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is of course, trying to organize uh, trainings for this kind of people. So basically developing uh, a course and yeah, in one day it's not gonna happen, but this can be an intensive workshop over one week where you um, try to teach people a very, uh, yeah, very basic things that they then later could use in their experiences. If, for example, yeah, let's say they have a house, they want to turn it into the stargazing uh, guest house. Another thing is also, I think, important to um, uh, to coordinate together with astronomers within the country, because then you can also partner with them, uh, astronomers, astronomy researchers, educators, and also astronomy amateurs and astronomy enthusiasts, where you can also work together with them in order to develop some course where then people can come to them uh, and have like, I don't know, let's say like, uh, again, uh, intensive workshop where they learn about different things, how to use them. Maybe also like, for example, a workshop on how to, uh, to use the most simple telescope because the most simple amateur telescopes, they're not expensive at all. That's also, and yeah, you don't need the, of course, you need a small training in order to be able to operate it, etc. But I think it's still possible. And so doing these different activities, partnering up with the already astronomers in the country, uh, translating the manual, um, organizing workshops. So that's something that we can do. But yeah, I totally agree that it's not easy. But I also don't find it extremely difficult or I don't find it as a impossible task to do. Okay, um, uh, Alexandra, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, I would like to ask about low. For example, we have a party that is connected with a black sky and what about Laos? For example, near this park, we can have a village or city 
are they having some laws like to control the amount of light in night when we have a season of uh, astroturism or maybe something connected with like when you can have light at house when no because people want to see a stars so maybe something like this is <laughs> is on this world uh Thank you, Alexander, for the question. So, uh, for example, about uh, the the example of the national park here in the north of the Netherlands that I was talking. Uh, so it's a national park, so there are no residential houses there. So there are no, um, yeah, so there is no regulation on where the light can be on and off because simply there is no residential area. But I think that there are regulations about the, the street lights, for example. Uh, so here in the Netherlands, there are lots of street lights, and uh, also um, astronomers quite often complain that uh, this amount of street lights is really not necessary because they are not proven to to reduce the the criminal uh, record. But uh, yeah, around the national park, you would make a, a regulation about the, the street lights, for example. But again, yeah, there are no residential uh, buildings in there, so. And there is no need for that. But for example, the, the different dark sky places across the planet, uh, of course, if you want to be a uh, part of the of the certified uh, dark sky uh, program, then you need to have a certain, uh, yeah, you need to have a certain level of the, the light pollution. And so for this, uh, for example, if you have lots of street lights, then you have to basically have a certain schedule when you have them and also the amount of how much you have them. I okay. hope that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, Julia? Hi, thanks for your presentation. And I don't have a question because it's not my uh, uh, item, but I want to say uh, what I thought about all the questions that sound and I uh, I remember how I study in my grandmother small city it was really dark uh, sky and I uh, I really like to stay at night and to watching on the uh, uh, sky I don't know anything about stars but it was really uh, pretty and uh, and I remember that in uh, last class in uh, school we studied astronomy so if you, uh, it's my propose that uh, we can, uh, first of all, we have in the school, we have a physical, uh, physical yeah, teacher who, uh, who uh, learn children a phys uh, physical and, uh, and they uh, study uh, about sky and we can use this resource and uh, we can use uh, children, uh, students who want to have their money, but they don't know how to do that. And we can, uh, that, uh, that, that students can be our researchers that uh, study them like in the course and plus the study in uh, school about uh, sky and cosmos and they are, can be a good uh, guide because they are will be interested by the money and uh, they have uh, not like my, uh, not only money because uh, but uh, they interested because of course and in school uh, and plus a teacher they can be uh, like a resource to to be a, like a guide and it will be a, a possibility for a small town because uh, it's too hard to ha have a job so they are more interested on that and uh, if about place uh, which uh, when why i said about a small town because you can go uh, near the a small lake or a, a river and uh, you will have a dark place it's uh, and you can have a small group for example five or ten person uh, by uh, go uh, uh, sorry uh, by the bicycle and uh, three for three or two kilometers and river and that's all you don't need to go in the mountains if we say about uh, like a 
local tourism. That's all. It's my thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks a lot for the comments. Uh, yeah, I think so, for example, about small towns, for sure that's, that's true because in big cities you have stronger light pollution. And then if you're in a small town, in a small village, then you don't need to go that far to go away from this light pollution. And also uh, having, uh, yeah, in, involving students or, or school kids, I think that's also a really great idea. So for example, um, yeah, in astronomy, uh, many things are done through volunteering. And so quite often the volunteering is done by astronomy students that they're doing their bachelor or master. And uh, I think that also the, the volunteer force uh, in astronomy, it's also one of the, the greatest forces that we have. So all the enthusiasm and all the love for astronomy that, uh, that people have, and then they put it into their volunteer activities. And yeah, of course, if we could have a budget and then also pay the guides, that's also amazing. So yeah, thank you, Yulia, very much for the for the comments. Very nice. Thanks. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask something? If not, I can maybe ask the next question. So uh, I, I was really interested in, in the topic because, like, especially from like the cultural perspective of like you know night gazing and so on. I, I'm wondering because you you were I'm wondering what um are the challenges maybe connected that with the kind of implementing this astro tourism activities and initiatives and spaces uh, because you you were, you mentioned like some threads but there were more like threads uh about like you know the success of this the activity or the initiative but i'm wondering if there are some challenges that we want we should uh, maybe think about when implementing this sort of activist activities, maybe uh, environmental or ethical challenges that it's worth considering, because I I'm thinking about tourism in general, and tourism is connected to all these different challenges about like uh, culture and environment and sustainability and ethics. So I'm wondering if there are similar, uh, maybe some thoughts or like if you have similar thoughts uh, in connected with this field as well. Yeah, so of course there are challenges involved as well. So for example, uh, one of the examples that I was giving was about the, uh, the telescope built in the South Africa, the SALT telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, I presented some numbers about how many people were, uh, like how basically um, building the telescope, then how, how, how did the, well, the team, let's say, building the telescope decided to give back into the socioeconomic development of the area and also uh, bring more astrotourism. Uh, and there are numbers about uh, how many more tourists they brought, uh, how many jobs they gave, etc. But then there is also uh, a downside of that. So, for example, uh, it became more popular touristic attraction and uh, there was a study showing that the number of Airbnbs uh, around the, the telescope grew, I think, from like six to 60 or like from two to 60. Um, but then, for example, the study showed that the, these Airbnbs were open only by people who already had quite a lot of money. So basically, in this way, you boost the tourism, but you kind of uh, give more opportunities for the um, yeah, for earning uh, money to to uh, not to the local community, but uh, more to already like a, a, let's say a top level of the community or or somebody who comes and has the the investment available to put it into there. Another thing was also that, for example, they do try to uh, they they showed very great numbers about how many school kids they reached uh, to, etc., and also again how many jobs they gave to people in their local communities. But at the same time, uh, it was also reported that the interaction between the tourist and local community was still almost non-existent. So in this way, you know, you want to boost the community and bring tourists, but there is almost no interaction between the the the, the local community and the tourists, which is not something that yeah, that you want to achieve eventually because you want to to use this uh, touristic experience also to help the community, to engage them, also to educate them, etc. So, yeah, these are the the challenges, for example, that I can see uh, for the for different directions of astrotourism. Um, yeah. And other things that we can also talk, for example, um, 
very important uh, quite often for when we talk about building of big observatories. They are built in uh, uh, remote locations that are also quite often sacred places for different indigenous communities. And also that these are places where uh, you still have pristine nature, so very uh, uh, wild and special flora and fauna. And then you come with a super huge telescope that you want to place in there. And so you have to, uh, yeah, ethically, uh, I think it's, it's a very complicated question towards the nature, but also towards the indigenous people. How do you do that? So, um, yeah, we, we saw it in, uh, in South uh, America, but um, also on the Hawaii. So, and and yeah, and it's uh, there is. I don't think there is like a, a, a one question, what one, one way to answer it. It's just it's it's very complicated, and of course, um, all these uh, yeah ethical questions and challenges they have to be taken into account. And yeah, yeah. definitely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I really like the the ideas that uh, you have mentioned in some of these cases that you presented about like kind of making the local community and maybe the indigenous communities as well kind of the hosts of these um, activities and experiences so they, that they can not only, uh, you know, observe how <laughs> someone is like um, uh, implementing some activities or some infrastructure in, in their area, but they can actually um, kind of co-organize uh, the program for that. And like uh, you mentioned the roles of the guides that they can take to, to be the guides for, for the tourists. But I'm wondering if there are any, like some other roles that um, local communities could potentially play in, uh, in such initiatives. Um, for sure, yes. And of course, it's going to depend on the experience that you're going to go for. So if it's, uh, if, if it's just a guided tour, then people can be guides. But for example, if you have a visitor center, creating a visitor center already creates a job because you will have the people uh, to, yeah, to do various tasks there, to, to manage it, et cetera. Um, I don't know, um, for example, if you have, a, um, you decide to do some astrophotography tour, then you can also have a person uh, from the local community who is into photography and then give them a training on astrophotography uh, you can also do some, um, for example, involvement of teachers from the local community. So you uh, uh, train them more in, in STEM or maybe uh, you give them some other related training to that. So you also um, involve them in this. So, yeah, depending on the experience, I think there are many different roles that the local community can play. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's also a really great uh, opportunity, I think, and uh, definitely has to be pursued. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. 